Okay, Boiler Nation, um, please help me give a warm, good welcome to our special guest tonight. He really needs no intro, the standout ESPN and Big Ten Network commentator, member of the original Baby Boilers, and Purdue legend, Robbie Hummel. What's hey. going on? Hey, thanks for coming on tonight. No, no problem. Happy to do it. Awesome. Um. Really just want to start off asking um, current thoughts on our uh, team right now and the situation they're in and, you know, moving forward, the best advice you can give these guys. Yeah, I, I think the team has done phenomenal. I mean, Zach Eady is playing at a level that I think rivals potentially Glenn Robinson, um, which if you think about how amazing that is, Glenn scored a thousand points in a single season, averaged 30 a game. And while Zach's numbers scoring aren't to that level, the rebounding, I mean, he's got 28 offensive rebounds his last four games. Um, he's just, he's dominating the games, not just on the offensive end, but, but defensively as well. You know, he protects the rim. He's not falling. Um, he's enormous. <laughs> you know, I'm 6'8", and I stand next to him, and I'm like, my God, he's just huge. Um, even when teams have doubled him, he still gets you on the offensive glass. He's become a pretty good passer. Um Purdue needs to make some threes for sure. And I'm surprised kind of that we haven't just because I think Purdue has good shooters um, that just haven't shot the ball great. I know Coach Payne has talked about how good of a shooter Fletcher Lawyer is. And I think he's shooting, I want to say, around like 30 or 31, 32. Um, Brandon Newman hasn't shot it great. Um, neither has David Jenkins. And I think all the J J – Jenkins is like a career – I want to say 40% three-point shooter. Lowest year was like 38 as a freshman. So there, there's some good shooters on the team. They just haven't gone down. Um, I think that that will improve. But because of of how good Zach has been, those guys are going to get open shots, and I, they just have to make them. You know, Otherwise, Zach's going to see kind of the defense that Indiana has seen with, with Trace Jackson Davis and, and loading up and you know multiple guys guarding your best player. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense, yeah. Okay, so one of my questions for you was you when your time when you played at Purdue, you got you inspired so many young kids getting to watch you and see how great you were. I just wondered who, when you were a kid, was your inspiration? Oh, that's easy. I mean, from a basketball standpoint, and again, before I start with them, I was fortunate. My parents were fantastic. You know, they took me to every freaking game ever. You know, like they didn't miss anything. <laughs> they traveled all over the country with me. Um, and really allowed me to play as much basketball as I wanted. Um, but if you're talking about like players, I had two favorites and, and it was not close. Bryce Drew, who played at my high school, you know, he's a Valpo high school kid, um, played at Valpo University for his dad. Homer Drew made the iconic shot in 1998. I was a ball boy in the years after that team. But I could tell you, you know, who I was next to, what I was holding, what I was doing um, when Bryce made the shot to beat Ole Miss to send him to the second round of the 98 NCAA tournament, and then Michael Jordan, um, which every kid that grew up around the Chicagoland area, definitely that was his favorite player. And, um, you know, I was fortunate to get to see him play at the United Center a couple of times. But those two guys by far were, were my two favorite players and very different. You know, Bryce, Bryce more of a shooter and a specialist in the NBA, whereas Michael's the greatest player of all time. Um, but I was very spoiled growing up in Valpo. Um, not just was there great basketball locally, but the Bulls were – an iconic dynasty, you know, in my seven, eight, nine years on uh, yeah, first seven, eight, nine years on on the planet. <laughs> so um, earlier you had mentioned the three point shooting, and before we started this, I just took a peek at ESPN and team wide, <clears throat> Purdue is shooting thirty one percent from three on this year, which is not probably sustainable to be a elite eight, final four team, and or even the way they're shooting right now is probably not sustainable for the talent level that they have. At some point, there's going to be positive regression to the mean. But I saw earlier, I think last week, a message board post where people have typically talked about uh, shooting environments when it comes to arenas with different sight lines that sometimes you see teams shoot worse when they're on the road or in neutral courts because sometimes we play in like football stadiums where your sight lines are different. But this post broke down that Purdue – when they're shooting not the Nike basketball that they're used to, like their shooting percentages are yeah. like way down. So as a guy who's played college professional three on three, is that something that 
as a player you notice at all when you're going to different arenas? Like, I know the sight lines is something always people always talk about. Does the actual yeah, sure, sure. The college is different because you know there's all these different balls, and some of them are shoe company oriented. You know, there's the Nike ball, there's the Adidas ball, there's the Under Armour ball. I always thought the Adidas and the Under Armour were pretty similar to Nike. There was one ball that I did not love playing with, but I always shot great, so I should have loved playing with it. And that was the Sterling ball that Wisconsin had through the Bo Ryan years. And this thing was hard as a rock, hard to palm. Wisconsin, the Kohl Center is a great building, but it's freezing because the ice is under there. And obviously Madison is not the warmest climate in the January and February months. Um, I never liked it, but I always shot it great. I Now I look at it, you know, I've played with a three-on-three ball, which is a, a men's weight and a women's size, like actual size. Somehow they've weighted it more to be a men's weight. I, I have no idea how. Um, I th- you get used to shooting it. Basketball is basketball. Um, the sight lines, there is something to be said about that. Like when we played in the NCAA tournament, we played my sophomore year at uh, at the the – Arizona Cardinal Stadium. And now with some of the newer football stadiums, you see they have the ability to put the floor kind of in the middle and then build around it. Well, the old school football stadiums were like, all right, we put you in the end zone and then bring in some portable bleachers that are like 15 rows. And then you have like 130 yards of just empty space. Now, if you're shooting from the corner looking at that empty space, that's a funky look. Um but for most, the most part, I never really thought about sight lines. I actually, the one time that I'd played in the football stadium, because I, I blew my knee out before we played at the Texan Stadium in 2010. So I have one game of football experience, and I shot it great. You know, it, it, there was games where I'd warm up and shoot like crap and then be amazing in the game, and vice versa, where I warmed up and I was like, I'm unconscious tonight, couldn't make anything in the game. Um, I think a lot of that is probably psychological with the ball, uh, more just a coincidence. I don't think guys are thinking like, Oh God, it's the Under Armour ball. What am I going to do? <laughs> um, but I, I do think that some of those things are just, you know, random data and, and the sample size is what, you know, they played 12 games. So it's not like they've, you know, played a hundred. Um, and the Nike ball is all like over 50 and the Adidas ball is 15. I, I think it's just a random coincidence and, and probably Purdue fans should not worry if we're playing at an Adidas school that, that our shooting percentages are automatically in the tank. Yeah. I know people have, you mentioned Under Armour and I know when Maryland joined the big 10, that was a big thing because they were, I think the only school that time at that time joining the big 10 that used an Under Armour ball and people were worried that that's going to be, different for teams that go on the road to Maryland, you're shooting something that you've never used before, but it's good to know from perspective that it's not. Yeah. I mean, like even, even the NCAA, right. The NCAA tournament ball was, we never played with it the entire year. Now some teams play with it during the season. Then all of a sudden the most important games of the season, you're like, yeah, you're playing with the NCAA tournament ball. (laughs) You know, like (laughs) you've grown up playing with a variety of balls. You never see the ball you play with in high school ever again. You know, it's the Wilson basketball that everybody loves then it becomes usually a shoe company brand. And then if you get to the NBA, you play with the NBA ball, which is totally different than the college ball. I will say that ball is so different in feel from those college balls that I remember my agent, um, when I was doing my pre-draft stuff after my senior year, said, well, we're going to send you some of the Spalding basketballs. I was like, well, we, I'm at Purdue. We have, you know, unlimited Nike balls. He's like, no, no, no. I, I want you to get the feel so that in these workouts, you're not surprised. And it, it is a different feel. So there, there is something to be said on that level, but the, I think the Nike Under Armour and Adidas balls are about the same. I really don't feel like there's much of a difference. Okay, I have another question. This one's kind of two-part. Where was your favorite place to play outside of Mackey, obviously, when you played? And then now that you're calling games, where's been your favorite place to call a game? Favorite place to play outside Mackey definitely was Assembly Hall in Bloomington. The rivalry is amazing. Um, it's really loud. Um, and it's just a different – the rivalry plays into that as well. You know, when Purdue rolls into Bloomington, it's a different animal. And when Indiana comes into West Lafayette, same thing for them. Um, to call a game, that's a tough question. I, a lot, most of the Big Ten venues are really good for that. Um I will go, you know, I, I really enjoy calling games at Michigan State, but I enjoyed playing there too. I, it's probably the same. Indiana's great. Michigan State's really good. Illinois, now that they're better, 
um, has been fun because their crowds are back to kind of what they, they used to be. You know, they had a kind of a down time there in the, the 2010s. Uh, but, but Brad has really got them kind of back on track, um, save for the last two weeks. <laughs> so uh, that's been a fun place to go. Um, maybe outside the box would be Nebraska. They have a great building. And on top of that, their, their fans are so hungry for them to be good at sports. You know, I mean, Lincoln is definitely kind of out there. Um, Omaha is probably an hour and 10 minutes, but there's no pro sports. So, you know, Nebraska is is the big show in town. And whether it's football or men's basketball, the way they support their, their volleyball team is unbelievable. Um, they get great crowds there. So I, I really enjoy going to Nebraska as well. And so piggybacking off the announcing question, our, one of our other podcast partners who couldn't make it wants to know who your favorite person is to call a game with and why is it Jason Benetti? That's like picking who my favorite son or daughter is, right? Like I can't, I can't do that to my other kids. <laughs> um, I mean, Jason is unbelievable. Um, you know, he's moved on to Fox, which was a great move for him. Um, he's getting really good college football games. He's doing games with Raph and Jimmy Jackson for basketball. Uh, I'm really lucky, you know, whether it's Jason or Brandon Gauden, um, who does Madden and then does Big Ten Network for um, for college basketball, but also does NFL games on Fox or Kevin Kugler, who I've worked with a good amount. Um, you know, the studio guys at BTN and Dave Rebson, Mike Hall, Rick Pizzo, those guys are phenomenal. Um, I, I work with really, really good people. Now, I can't pick who my favorite is. Um, I can't do that to any one play-by-play guy, but I will say I'm, I'm really lucky that I do work with guys that are really, really good at their job. Awesome. Um, right now, uh, I don't know if you're like doing anything for your three on three team or like if there's anything upcoming for you guys or what are your like next plans with all of that? I mean, I, yeah, I'm about to be done. I'm, I'm hanging it up. I'm old. I can't move. <laughs> um, I just, and the travel is brutal. Now I'm going to be involved with USA basketball. I think, um, from maybe a coaching standpoint, okay. I was down, uh, the America, Cup, which is the event of all the teams in North and, and Central America, uh, not even Central America, really Mexico, the Caribbean, and North America. Um, <coughs> got together in Miami and played in an, an event. Fran Fraschilla coached the team from ESPN, and then I kind of helped out. Um, you know, Canyon Barry was on that team, who I play with. Kareem Maddox was as well. So I, I'll definitely be involved, but from a playing standpoint, it's hard because I don't play basketball from really November through March. And I'm getting to the point where I'm like, do I really miss playing that much? Which is kind of sad because, I mean, it's been such a big part of my life. But uh, I love to play golf now. <laughs> That's really kind of filled that void. The travel is tough. You know, you're flying all over the world. And last year, this summer was really strange. I was worried going into the season because I was like, I called 80 games. I worked all the way through the Final Four. I hadn't touched the ball since November and like middle of May was the first tournament over in Japan. And it's in this great city called, uh, oh, now I'm blanking on the name. What is it called? Um, it's a suburb of Tokyo. I've been there before. They're known for their dumplings. They've got incredible dumplings, um, which is definitely not the greatest pregame meal, but um, they're really, really good. Uh, Utsunami is the name of the city. And, you know, we would always actually, we've played well there. They've had the, the World Tour Final, which is kind of like the end of the season event, which they jack the money up for and you get more points for playing in it. Um, it's like their premier event. Well, this year they decided we're going to have not just the World Tour Final, which they moved to Dubai, and they just played that a couple weeks ago, but we are going to have like a, basically a World Tour opening of the top 12 teams from last year, and it'll be in Utsunomiya. So... I think in the 2019 World Tour Final, we lost in a, a controversial ending. Um, the referees called some fouls at the end. So we lost to the Serbian team that's been the best team, and they just shot four free throws to win it from a tie game, um, which was tough. But we'd always played well, and we got second here in this World Tour opener. And I was I shot as well as I could. But, uh, but at the same time, I'm thinking, I have put no work in. Um, so maybe this will just be the way it is, right? I'm, I'm older. I'm a veteran. Um, maybe I don't have to practice. And the rest of the season, I shot it so, so bad. So I, I can't move. I can't guard people anymore. I can't get by anybody anymore. I can still shoot. I'll always be able to do that. But the movement part, um, I just, and it's humbling, right? Like I played in the TBT as well. And I was, I was with Ryan Smith and DJ Bird last night. 
Um, cause I I'm down in Atlanta, uh, right now at my girlfriend's parents' place. They, they live down here and they're in, in uh, Macon at Mercer where Greg Gary's the head coach. And we were talking about the TBT cause Ryan and DJ were the coaches. And we were laughing about how, when we played Floyd Mayweather's team, they were pressing us at one point in the first half and Mitch Creek was guarding me. I didn't, I'd never heard of Mitch Creek before this. I guess he's been in the NBA some and he's Australian and he's played overseas at a high level. He's guard me. He ended up with 30 points. Many of them scored on, on me, which is unfortunate. Um, but we were trying to throw the ball in, and Mitch Creek was yelling ahead to Jordan Crawford, who was their point guard, to deny Lewis Jackson the ball. And it dawned on me, this dude smells blood in the water. Like, he literally is telling them to deny Lewis so that I'll have to be the guy that brings the ball up. And I haven't brought the ball up against pressure in four <laughs> years. So, like, I'm not ready for this. Thank God Lewis got open. But I was like, whoa. And the – the money team had pros. Like, Jimmer Fredette is a pro. Jeremy Evans, I played with in Moscow, played against him in the NBA. He's still playing at a EuroLeague level. He's a pro. You know, I haven't played professional basketball in a five-on-five -five capacity in, like, five years. So my TBT career is definitely, if not on the downside, over. And my three-on-three -three career, barring a massive change of heart, is probably over as well, which is okay. So just, just for people that may not be super familiar with the advent of three on three basketball you have like maybe just like kind of like a little like quick overview you can get sure. to it. i know my first experience with it this year or recently was the summer olympics last year yep seeing it make its debut i believe in the olympics and watching the i know the women won gold and that was yep. actually on at a watchable time and not at like yeah right right most of the other games but that's been the big growing, I guess, factor of three on three is that it was going to be an Olympic sport. And that, that's kind of what sucked me into playing. And on top of that, I, I love to play. Um, you know, I, I retired, I think I was 28 or 29. Um, so I was, I didn't retire from playing professional basketball because I wasn't good enough to play, especially like European basketball. Um, I had a really good year in Russia, actually. Uh, my last season, I shot, I want to say 47 or 48% from three. I averaged like 10 or 11 points a game. Um, I played well, and I had offers to go back over there, but I, I, I wanted to be in the NBA if I was going to play. Being in Russia was really, really hard. Um, I had an offer to go back to Jerusalem. I had an offer to go back to Spain. Um, I had a workout with the Bucks, and then hurt my back shooting the day before I was going to leave. So to me, I was like, this is a sign, right? Like I, I just – I can't catch a break of staying healthy. I cannot go back and be overseas for another 10 months because I hated it last time so much um so i really i had these kind of offers to do tv from big Ten network and espn and because of that i thought well i you know i'm not leaving the game i can still be involved and i'll figure out what i do in the summers and craig moore who you guys might remember from northwestern he played there my freshman and sophomore year was a really good shooter um on those like bill carmody teams we became friends from playing against each other not just in the Big Ten, but then in the summers, I'd see him in Chicago when I was up there. And, um, you know, we'd, we'd text during the seasons when I was a pro. He he worked on Wall Street. He moved to New York. And people on Wall Street must not work a whole lot because he knew every box score. Whenever like, All of the guys I knew from the Big Ten, he'd follow. Um, if I had a good game, he'd text me and be like, hey, you know, way to play. If I didn't play, you know, hey, are you hurt? What happened? He, he just followed really closely. So I got a text from him in the summer in like August. He's like, I haven't seen where you're signing. Where are you going to play? And I was like, dude, I'm done. I've got these offers to do TV. I'm, uh, I'm going to hang it up and, and just be done with five on five. I can't go back overseas. This workout with the Bucks kind of fell through because I hurt my back. Um, so I'm, I'm going to retire. And he tried to convince me not to because he's like, the real world's terrible. Like, don't do it. Um, and I, you know, I'm lucky. I, TV is definitely not the real world of a nine to five job. Um, so I, I felt pretty confident in that, but he then kind of went to, well, if you're not going to play five on five, you should play three on three with us in the summer. And the schedule fit perfectly. It was like TV is November to April and three on three back then was pretty much May to November. So it fit like a glove. Like it couldn't have been any more perfect for me in that situation. And I was skeptical for sure because he was explaining this to me and it's like, so you're going to, we're going to fly across the world and play a maximum of five 10 minute games. So 50 minutes of basketball, it's free. Food is paid for, hotels are paid for. And we, if we win, we keep the money. 
<laughs> like that does not sound like real life, you know, like that's, that's a pretty big stretch. And we've been very lucky. John Rogers, who played basketball at Princeton, um, is the CEO of Aerial Investments in Chicago, which has been a very successful investment firm that he started. And he played three on three after his playing career at Princeton, um, alongside Craig Robinson, who's Barack Obama's brother-in-law, and uh, you know Arnie Duncan, who has been the Secretary of Education, played at Harvard, I believe, um, in his college career. So he played. There was this tournament called Shoot the Bull that was in the Chicago Stadium parking lot back in the 80s and 90s, and John's team would win it like every year. So he's very invested in three-on-three. He is the reason that this was financially feasible. And then once we started winning, FIBA will pay for tournaments. Um, USA Basketball, to get more teams playing, has been very helpful in terms of that. But for my first event, you know, Craig, they, they were kind of in a bind. They needed a player, and he was like, hey, can you go to Seoul, South Korea, and play? And in my mind, I was like, well, if I hate it, I'll just quit. <laughs> like, I'll just never play again. And honestly, I've never been to Asia, so I'll just, I'll go. And, you know, fast forward to today, I've probably played in 50 events and been in, I would guess, 14, 15, 16 different countries. And some of the trips have been incredible. Um, you know, we had one where we played in Slovenia and then drove around, I believe it's the Adriatic Sea, to play south of, of Venice on the ocean on this tournament right on the beach. And then, um, you know, when that one ended, drove up through Milan where I played for Giorgio Armani's team when I was playing five on five and uh, ate at my favorite pizza spot, which was great. Um, stayed the night at Lake Como and then drove up through Switzerland, through the Alps and played in Lausanne on Lake Geneva. So like that's an incredible life experience, right? Um, compare that to our trip to Huayan, China, not nearly as cool, but still you're seeing a part of the world that you'd never never get to go to so um from that perspective it's been great it was an opportunity to play in the olympics it's grown every year they started it in 2012 and, and 2020 was the first um olympic iteration of it so um hopefully 2024 goes a little better we unfortunately lost to the netherlands in the quarterfinals of the olympic qualifying tournament even though we won the world championship that did not automatically qualify us somehow for the olympics so you had to qualify again um, and you know, in a 10 minute game, it's, it's really hard. Um, Canyon Barry got hurt the day before we left. So it was, it was a kind of a tough deal. Um, uh, but with USA basketball, there's never, there's not really an excuse, right? Basketball is our sport. And when you don't make it, uh, that's just not good enough. So hopefully we're, we're better off in 2024 for Paris. All right. I have another one. Um, if you've looked at Twitter at all, which I'm sure you have seen some stuff, um, a lot of people have been comparing, um, Braden Smith's hustle to that of Chris Kramer. Since you played yep. with Chris, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on on that. Yeah, that, that's an interesting comparison. I think Chris was certainly a little bigger. He's six four, probably weighed two fifteen, two twenty. I mean, he was pretty solid. He could have played football at the Big Ten level and fit in perfectly. Uh, Braden Smith certainly a smaller player, but um, you know, I think their scrappiness is similar. Braden gets his hand on the ball all the time. He's just always kind of around it. And that's what Chris's greatest strength as a defender was. He just – he was always around the ball. You know, if he was chasing guys off of it, he was phenomenal at that. I, I think about Drew Neitzel, like, having nightmares of going against Chris Kramer uh, <laughs> just because he was so physical with him off the basketball. But then, you know, whenever there would be a home run type play where end of game, a team's got to go the length of the court, and they'd throw, like, a baseball pass – it seemed like Chris was always like a defensive back, just jumping up and, and he'd go get it over the top of everybody, even though he's six, three, six, four. Um, he was such an impressive athlete and he just had a nose for the ball. But I, I think their, their mindsets are similar. I think they're, you know, just being a pest, they're similar in that regard, but they're, they're certainly different players in the sense that Braden Smith is phenomenal in pick and roll. And offensively he is, He's really advanced for a freshman playing the point guard position. Chris is more of a two. He could play the one, but um, Chris really sacrificed, I think, a lot offensively um, for our for our team. He's a screener. He moved the ball. I think at times we want guys wanted him to shoot it more. Um, and if you watch Chris play as a pro, he was much more offensive minded. You know, he played more of the point guard position. He played more pick and roll. He didn't really do that as much at Purdue. Some of that was sacrificing for guys like myself or Etwan or Jawan Johnson, um, Keaton Grant. But he he had his role and he, you know, he thrived in it. But I do think that I 
I can see where the <coughs> fact that opposing fans are going to hate Braden Smith the way that they hated Chris Kramer. <laughs> uh, you know, it's yet to be seen. Like Chris had such a flair for the dramatic, and I, I like, I, I love that about him. Like we beat Indiana, he goes and he stomps on the state, okay. and then all of a sudden the arena is just like up in arms. Like I don't know if Braden Smith will embrace it to that level of villain that Chris did. Um, <laughs> that's yet to be seen. Um, but teams are still going to hate to play against him because he's good. You know, he's just a good yeah. player. Absolutely. I, I think the people will remember Chris's defense against Steph Curry when you guys played Davidson. Yep. But I still think the best individual defensive performance I've seen in a college basketball game is when you guys went to Tuscaloosa. I totally played, agree. He totally – he, he punked them was. so hard. That crowd was electric that first half because Mark Ingram had just won the Heisman. Yep. In the second half, I am blanking on the announcer. It might have been Jimmy Dykes. Oh, it was Jimmy. Jimmy Dykes did the game, yes. I don't That's know who the player every, was, but Jimmy did the game. It was best defensive player in the nation. Best defensive yeah. player in the nation because that was the last five minutes basically ripped Alabama. Was, yeah, Mik- Mikhail Torrance him. wanted no part of him. I mean, Mikel Torrance was a pretty good player. I actually announced his games in the TBT this year. <laughs> Before I played, I announced the games at Xavier, and he was playing for a team um, out of Alabama. But, yeah, I agree. The Curry thing, like Kramer did a good job on him, but Lewis Jackson got a pretty big piece of him, and so did Keaton Grant. Like, it wasn't just Chris, and that's not to take away from the way he played, but I we threw bodies at, at Steph Curry. Um Chris, the way he finished the game at Bama, and that was an incredible comeback. You know, we're down 17 with like 15 minutes to go or 14 minutes to go, and it's just like a light switch got flipped, and all of a sudden we just weren't – we went from playing horribly to incredibly, um, which you don't see in many road games, especially at the college level. But we finally started making some shots. We finally started breaking their press to score instead of just to kind of – get it across we were really really bad in the first half Jawan Johnson was in crazy foul trouble um but yeah I mean the way that Chris kind of just got into those ball handlers and I mean by the end of the game you could tell they just quit like Mikel Torrance was like I cannot deal with this pressure anymore he turned it over three or four times and that, that's that's about as good of a defensive performance as I I've seen um he he totally punked their guards he totally stole their spirit I was I rem- will remember that because I went to Iowa and I remember watching that in the dorm room. That was my freshman year. In the first half, my friends kept telling me like, "Why Purdue's going to lose by twenty? This is awful." And then, basically, I just actually pulled up the play by play from the last from that game, and basically, once it got to six minutes to go. Bama scored one point the last six minutes. Yeah. No, I mean, it was – and we were scoring most possessions, and it it was quite the comeback. It it was an um, incredible atmosphere in the sense that Mark Ingram wins the Heisman like 15 minutes before the game starts. They showed it on the Jumbotron, so the building was electric. And the one other thing that I really will never forget from that game is that the Bama student section had gone to our Facebooks and looked up all these photos from Halloween. So I was was, (laughs) – Buzz Lightyear for Halloween, and Kramer was John Daly, which is so random. But he had like a pillow to make like to make him look fat in his shirt. Um, you know, I think Stevie Loveless, who's one of our walk-ons, was like a cowboy. I mean, but they had these photos, and they were printed out like life-size life-size photos that they just had in the student section. Um, so that was pretty funny. And then on top of that, Ingram won the Heisman. Um, so the atmosphere was. Even though you don't think of Alabama basketball, especially back then, as being a huge draw, it was definitely a big game for them because we were ranked fifth or sixth. And then Ingram winning the Heisman was just like, you know, I put it over the top. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, I, I kind of go back to uh, when you were playing and um, paint. If you have any good locker room stories for Coach Payne, I want to hear your favorite. <laughs> Um, good locker room stories from Coach Paint. Um, you put me on the spot here. There's, <laughs> there's definitely good ones. Um, I'm trying to think what would be the best one to tell. Um, I think the funniest. This is pretty funny, actually. Um, and he would probably deny this, but I. You could ask Ryan Smith and Lewis Jackson. This happened. 
we played at Penn State my senior year and that my fifth year. And that was a hard season in the sense that, you know, I got hurt and we were ranked third in the country, about to be number one in the country. When I blew my knee out at Minnesota, I get hurt again. So you look at how different the team was in my fifth year from when I had last played, you know, like Etwan Moore is no longer there. He's in the NBA. Juwan Johnson, same deal in the NBA. Keaton Grant's playing overseas. Chris Kramer's playing overseas. Like we've, so you've missed out on these guys that are like, you know, all conference caliber players and you're having to replace them. And it was definitely hard because I'm thinking like, Oh, I, I need to score more. And that was probably, I was taking bad shots because of it. And eventually coach bank came to me and was just like, dude, you just need to play. Like you just need to, if you, if you, if you should shoot, you're open, shoot it. If you should pass and you know, that's the right play, then then do that. There was, there was no longer pressure to score after we kind of talked that through. And that was hard because I just thought, well, everybody is kind of gone, but we still had some really good players on the team. Um, but but with, we lost at Penn State, and it was a horrific loss. I mean, they were not good. It was one of Pat Chambers' early teams. This dude named Billy Oliver had like 16 or 17 points. I think he led everyone in scoring, and that was like his second-to-last game of his college career. Um, so we, we played this game, and we go into the locker room after the game, and, and this is like a loss that you think, like, this could legit ruin our NCAA tournament chances because we really didn't have a great marquee win in the non-conference. We lost to Butler, who wasn't very good. And it was one of those years where in February, everything just all of a sudden clicked, and we were way better than we had been um, earlier in the year. And that's how we were almost able to beat Kansas. We won at Michigan. Like, we finally were able to put it together. Um, but <laughs> Paint walked in the locker room after the game, and just he was really mad. And he basically was like, our seniors are shit. And then just walked out. <laughs> so me, Ryan Smith, and Lewis Jackson were just like, oh, my God. Uh, you know, it was a horrible loss. He wasn't wrong. Not that night. We might have been okay the rest of the year, but we were not good on, on that night. And uh, he, there's a lot of them that are just, like, funny to look back on. Um, and, you know, Coach Paint was definitely a guy that um, – he's, he's, an, he's an elite coach. And we give him a hard time now for being too nice to the players because it's it's different. You know, things have changed. Um, but he get after you. But that's why we went to Purdue. You know, I, I went there to get better. And I went there because I knew he'd coach me hard. And not that he doesn't coach those guys hard now, but I think just the times have changed. Um, and with NIL and the transfer portal, like the times have really changed. Um, but, yeah, that, that all, we always laugh about that, him saying uh, our seniors are shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Is your second favorite story? I want to say it's from that same year, and I want to get the game right. Was it the Xavier game where he said you took the worst shot in the history of basketball? Yeah, yeah, it was. He wasn't wrong. I mean, I took like a total heat check uh, with like 20 on the shot clock, maybe more because it was 35 at the time. Probably was like 25 on the clock. Just tried to pass. No one was open. It was like, all right, screw it. One-on-one, -on -one, iso ball. You know, step back, fade away, three, air ball. <laughs> he said it's the worst shot. We were watching film the, the day after the game, and we, again, another missed opportunity. Xavier was good, and we had him beat. Uh, we were up like 20 and lost. And watching film, and he was like, Rob, that's the worst shot in, in the history of basketball right there. <laughs> he just said it very casually like that, which was, looking back again, pretty funny. All right. I think we just have uh, one last question for you and then a prediction. And the question – I don't even know if you'll be able to answer this, but our other podcast partner wanted us to ask it. He wants to know approximately how many of Kelvin Sampson's illegal phone calls and texts did you receive? I don't think very <laughs> many. No, no, no I, don't, I don't think it was very many. I know Scott Martin and I were on the report. Uh, we had to be interviewed by the NCAA for it. During our freshman year, uh, I remember being with Ed Kennedy, who's kind of like the team's lawyer. Um, he was Coach Katie's lawyer. And he's still very active. He goes to all the games still. He sat in there with us, and we had to answer questions. Um, the crazy thing is now is that that's not even illegal. Like, that would be fine today. Um, but at the time, you know, phone plans were very different. My parents, God bless them for this, but, like, I, you had text plans back then of, like, 200 or 300 texts that you could send or receive. And... I use this totally to my advantage to be like, oh, yeah, coaches are texting me a lot. And they were, but I also was texting my friends or my girlfriend or like, you know, like it wasn't just the coaches that were adding up to these like thousand texts a month. But because of the minutes and the texts, 
that was expensive. You know, like you, if you were just a recruit and you were getting these texts, like you had to pay for them. Whereas now we think of texts as just, it's yeah. like an instant message, right? Like AOL, but on your phone. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know how many, I don't think it was all, all that many, but I do know that we, uh, we were interviewed for it. Um, I remember a time at the Peace Jam, actually, um, Scott Martin had done an interview like a month prior because we all played on the same AU team, myself, Etoine Moore, Scott Martin. And he had given an interview that didn't run for a long time saying, oh, yeah, I talked to Coach Sampson on the phone. Um, you know, it was great to talk to him, like just a really generic. Well, then it didn't run for a month. And in the, in the time in between, he had part of his punishment was all communication had been taken away. And he couldn't, he couldn't like text or call recruits. So the NCAA actually took Scott into this room at the Peace Jam and they were like interrogating him about these, you know, which is like, again, about some phone calls as if that's like the most important thing the NCAA should have been tracking down. Um, but it, it, it is comical to me that now, like, that's not even a violation. And now Kelvin Sampson has it, he's got that thing rolling down at Houston. Those dudes are beasts, they're fun to watch. And then last thing we got for you before we'll let you go. Uh, what is your final prediction for this version of Purdue basketball? Man, I, I don't know if I could do that. It, it's, it's really hard because of everyone I've watched, I don't think any one team this year blows you away. Like, oh, yeah, surefire, Final Four. You know, UConn has played really well. I wouldn't say their schedule has been overly difficult. Um, Houston has, has gotten back kind of on track. They're 12 and one. I, we just talked about Kelvin Sampson. Their only loss is, is to Alabama, who's certainly talented, but then they went and, and won at Virginia. You know, that's, that's as good of a win as anybody has all year. UCLA has kind of flexed their muscles here, showing against Maryland, how good they are and how well they've played. Um, I don't, I don't know if I can give a prediction. I, I think Purdue is set up though, to have an incredible season. And there's no reason to think why they cannot be considered a Final Four team. No, no one is overwhelming. And with Zach Eady in the mix, you know, he's – to me, he's the best player in college basketball. So if you got him on your team, you've – the best offense can be just miss a shot so he can go get it and dunk it, right? right. <laughs> okay. I think that then wraps up all the questions we had for you, Robbie. So cool. uh, thanks for joining us and good – have fun announcing – games the rest of the season. Will do. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Robbie. Thank no you. problem. No problem. And then, so, for Boiler Up, Beer Down, this is Rouse 23 with Audra McKenzie and Carrie. So, uh, thanks for tuning in, and we will talk to you next time. <laughs>